Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and otherwise. I'm Lamar Haven. Welcome to 999. Nine hours, nine persons, nine doors. We got an hour into it last week. This week, I'm, we're going to get deep into this. Loading complete. Resume game. All right, so when last we left our hero, Junpei, I believe is his name, he managed to get himself out of the room that was flooding. <laughs> Inside a boat, I think. Accompanied by a wall of angry water, Junpei shot out of the room and into the opposing wall. Gasping to catch breath, he looked around. He was in a narrow hallway. The water that had followed him out of the room was rapidly pouring out the door. It flowed quickly down the hallway and slammed into the foot of the short flight of stairs. Just five steps, in fact. And at the bottom of the sh at the top of the short staircase, a door, another door. Junpei leapt up the stairs and straight for the door. Uh, I think I'm gonna swap the screens. Give me a sec. The door burst open. Junpei exploded out of it, only to freeze in his tracks. What other possible response could there be to what he saw? What the hell? His voice trailed off, and all he could do was stare. A polished floor stretched out before him, ornate staircases rising up from the edges, each one of them equidistant from the other. The stairs and pillars were solid wood, and Art Nouveau embellishments and decorations covered the walls and pillars. It looked like nothing so much as an entrance to a luxurious mansion from the early 1900s. Junpei couldn't help but wonder, was he really in a ship? The water quickly filling the hallway behind him suggested that yes, he was. As he looked, a fresh wave rolled out from the room he'd been in, gathering speed as it moved toward the stairs. Yeah, that's what I thought. This is totally a Wait, what the hell? A wave?! Sh shit I gotta get out of here! Jubei spun around, his wet shoes squeaking in protest on the polished floor, and ran towards the tremendous staircase in front of him. C deck. B deck. As he ran, he glanced quickly at the plates mounted on the wall, denoting the decks of the ship. He took the stairs two at a time, not entirely sure what he, uh, where he would find himself. Just as he began to wonder where, in fact, the stairs did lead. Well, hello there. Junpei saw another person out of the corner of his eye. He stopped short, nearly tripping over the next stair, and looked. It wasn't just one person he'd seen. On the landings to the left of the stairs, there were four people staring at him. And on the right side, three more. All told, there were seven of them. It looked as though they had been on their way down the stairs. They'd stopped short when they saw Junpei, their eyes wide. He'd done the same, of course, and now they stood there staring at one another. Junpei didn't move, one foot placed awkwardly in the next step in the middle of a stride. Who were these people? This entire interaction lasted only a matter of seconds. The woman spoke to Junpei, and time began to move again. I guess there's another one of us now. The woman is dressed, Junpei thought, rather like a dancer. Her clothes covered very little, and her prodigious jewelry, little more. Hey, you! Come on! Hurry! With no further ceremony, she ran, straight past Junpei and toward the doors behind him. The sudden proximity of a woman with such striking assets left Junpei no momentarily stunned. Focus! But the others wasted no time and quickly followed the strange woman. The first to pass Junpei was a young man with silver hair. He threw a quick glance in Junpei's direction as he ran, muttering, Huh, one of us, huh? Following him was an older man, his face calm, without fear. Soft wrinkles sprouted from his eyes, and he came close enough as he passed Junpei to see wisps of grave hair, uh, gray in his hair. His composure and shock of uh, hair struck Junpei as rather than an elderly lion. Going up won't do you any good. There are two doors, but neither of them will open. Next to this beak was a girl with pink hair and a high voice. C come on! Aren't you coming? We gotta hurry! Her small hand was wrapped around the wrist of another man. His eyes were closed, almost as though he were sleeping. His features were graceful, almost serene. He was dressed rather elegantly for someone his age. Something about his posture seemed very refined. Jumpy couldn't help feeling he was noble and dignified somehow. He'd certainly never seen one, but this man seemed like what Junpei had always imagined a prince would be like. The nine of us, then. 
All of the cards are in hand. What does all the cards are in hand mean, he wondered. Junpei opened his mouth to ask what the other man meant. But the girl in pink ha hair rushed past him and they were gone. He turned just in time to see two more people running toward him. One of them had hair like a bird's nest, and looked as though a stiff breeze might topple him. And the other was a veritable mountain of a man. The scrawny one said nothing and scuttled past Junpei as though he were running from something. Hey, what the hell are you just standing there for? Didn't you hear him? The doors on A deck are no good. We gotta check the doors on B deck. Got it? No go! Before he had a chance to respond, the man laid a massive hand on Junpei's shoulder. No more effort than Junpei would have used to brush a fly, the man shoved him out of the way. Whoa! Thrown off balance by the man in recent events, it took Junpei a few steps to get his bearings. Finally regained his balance and looked up at what the other seven had been running toward. There were two pairs of large iron doors set into the wall in front of him. They looked like they looked quite sturdy, and each had handles jutting from them. Written across the surface of each door was red paint was a number. The door on the right had a four, and the door on the left had a five. They're the same. The guy Junpei had decided to call Silver was mumbling to himself. The room I woke up in had a number on the door, just like that. You too, uh, you too, eh? With an arched eyebrow, the lion looked over at Silver. My cell was the same. A number upon the door. I opened it, ran down the hallway outside, and found myself in a rather grand room full of stairs, as I suspected the rest of you. It was as though the floodgates had been opened. They all began to talk at once. Me too. I did too. Yeah, a door with a number on it. It soon became clear that each one of them had awoken in a room with a locked door and solved a puzzle to escape. It all ended up in the same room. Almost as though they'd been guided here. Yes, we all saw the same thing. That's so important, we have to hurry. You think I don't know that lady? Before the dancer had time to finish, Silver was already running. He grabbed hold of the door labeled 5 and pulled. However... Fuck! It's not opening! This damn thing won't even budge! Move. You're in the way. The mountain grabbed Silver's shoulder and tossed him aside. His path cleared, he took a few steps back, then threw himself at the door. Once. Twice. Three times. Four times. The door shook as his body slammed into it, but showed no signs of breaking or opening. The mountain threw himself at the door again. Junpei turned toward door four. Next to the door on the wall was a small box. It looked like the one that he'd seen in his room next to that door. If it was the same, then this door was likely locked as well. Still, he had to check. Junpei grabbed a handle and threw all of his weight into it. Ah! Gah! It was locked as tight as the door next to it as he'd suspected. Damn it! Junpei punched the door, did not respond. Were these the only doors, he wondered. He'd barely finished with thought when the sea plate deck had passed on the way up, spraying unbidden to his mind. His body moved before he had time to think. Jubei turned and ran back towards the stairs. He had scarcely taken a step when, at the top of the stairs, next to an ornate clock embedded in the wall, he saw a person. It was a girl. She looked to be the same age as Junpei. He froze, unable to look away from her face. He wasn't confounded by her beauty or something equally silly. No, there was another reason he couldn't take his eyes off the girl. Junpei had seen her somewhere before. He couldn't quite remember where, but he knew. He knew he'd met her before. The girl, too, stared at Junpei, similarly stunned. Her response suggested she'd seen him before somewhere as well. Without saying a word, Junpei walked slowly towards her. She didn't move. It was as though she was held in place by some sort of magic spell. As Junpei stopped, stepped onto our landing, the spell broke. No sooner had he set foot down, and the whole ship shook a second time. Ugh! The quake caught the girl unprepared, and she fell. Moving on instinct, Junpei le leapt to catch her. Or so he thought. Her face was far closer than it should have been, mere inches from his own. He was flat on his back, he had landed squarely, and she had square, landed squarely on top of him. The girl seemed as confused as he did, and her face suggested she didn't fully recover from seeing him. For a moment, that seemed to stretch for a very long time. They stared at one another. 
The ship stopped shaking. Everything was quiet. Water could be heard from the bottom of the ship, lapping faintly at walls and ceilings, but eventually that faded as well. The silence was complete. A thick, muffling blanket. At last, the girl opened her mouth. Oh my gosh! Is that you, Jumpy? 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 Hey, Death Lotus! Good to see ya. Her words echoed through Junpei's head, and suddenly his memory returned. Uh, Akane? Why hadn't he realized it before? The girl was Akane Kurashiki. She and Junpei had been friends since childhood. They'd gone to elementary school together for six years. You know what? I'm gonna write down some of these characters' names so I don't forget them. Cause yeah. Akane. Kura. Shiki. And a little note to remind me who she is. I'm not a hoe? Oh well, I, I've tried. I guess I'm not as good at it as I thought it was. What was she doing on the ship? Her soft eyes were only inches away from his own. He could feel the warmth of her face. Feelings he thought long forgotten began to work their way to the surface. He could feel his face heating up. At that moment, a speaker crackled to life, and a cold, eerie voice filled the room. Welcome aboard. I welcome you all, from the bottom of my heart, to this, my vessel. With the voice's invasion, the spell began in between Junpei and Akane was broken, and all hints of burgeoning romance instantly forgotten. They hurriedly untangled themselves from one another, and struggled to their feet. Their seven companions had heard the voice as well, and many of their faces had gone pale. They looked around frantically, desperately, desperate to locate the source of the voice. At last they found it, a speaker set in the ceiling. I am Zero. The captain of this ship. I am also the person who invited you here. The voice was harsh, obscured occasionally by the crackle of static. But Junpei recognized it. How could he have forgotten it? It was the same voice he had heard from the man in the gas mask. Hey! Asshole! What the hell is this? Come on out here. I want to get a look at you. What do you mean to, what do, you mean to do to us? I mean to have you participate in a game. Some of you, I know, are familiar with this game. The Nonary Game. It is a game where you put your life on the line. Nonary Game? What the hell's that? The voice continued, implacable. Implacable? Implacable? I don't know how you pronounce that word, actually. The rules of the Nonary Game can be found on your persons. They are simple rules. Read them. Nonary game? Hey, there's something in my pocket. Check it out. Silver reached into his pocket and pulled out a small slip of paper. The rest of them reached in their own pockets and pulled out similar slips of paper. Junpei followed suit and dug into the pocket of his pants. He felt the telltale crumble of paper and slightly damp from his earlier ordeal. Hey, I got one too. And it would seem Zero is in fit to grace us with a letter. Would you mind terribly reading it to us, young man? His request had been delivered to Junpei, who, after a short moment of surprise, did as he'd ask. Hmm, why wouldn't you just have everybody read it on their own? Do you not have one, Lion? Cause, uh, interesting. I wonder if he does have one. And I just misread. On this ship, you will find a handful of doors emblazoned with numbers. You will call them the numbered doors. The doors in front of you are a pair of the same. The key to opening these numbered doors are the numbered bracelets that each of you possess. Should you total the numbers on your numbered bracelets and find that the digital root of that number is equal to the number of that door, the door will open. Again with the digital roots. Lame. Only those who have opened the door wait pass through. There are, however, limits. Only three to five people can pass through a no one numbered door. All those who enter it must. All those who enter must leave. All those inter must contribute. Bracelet, Junbei figured, had to mean the bulky thing on his wrist. He glanced around. It looked like everyone else had one as well, and had come to the same conclusion. The purpose of this game is simple. What, that means if we have two doors, that means there has to be four for one door and five for the other. I'm going to write that down. 
So four for one door. Five for the other. Digital roots. Let's see. Leave the ship alive. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that carries a nine. Junpei had reached the end of the letter. There was a long moment of silence, and when the speaker crackled to life once more. There is one last thing I must tell you. As you have no doubt surmised, the ship has begun to sink. On April 14th, 1912, the famous ocean liner Titanic crashed into an iceberg. After remaining afloat for two hours and forty minutes, it sank beneath the waters of the North Atlantic. I will give you more time. Nine hours. That is the time you will be given to make your escape. The voice finished, and the speaker went silent. The sound of a bell tolling echoed through the hall. Okay, so our nine hours have just started? It came from the dance hall adjacent to the stairwell. It took those assembled on the stairs mere moments to trace the sound of the antique clock embedded in the wall. Seven, eight, nine. The sound of the ninth bell faded away. The tenth never came. That meant the time was nine o'clock. Most likely nine o'clock in the evening. When Jupe had peered out the window of his cell, he'd seen nothing but blackness. It had to be nighttime, or we're underwater. Which is what I suspect. If that was the case, then they would need to escape by 6 a.m. the following day. Now, it is time that our game begin. I wish you all the best of luck. Do you know? The speaker went silent and did not speak again. Silver yelled at the speaker with language coarse enough to embarrass a sailor, but the rest of Junpei's companions were silent, deep in thought. Junpei, too, was consumed by his thoughts. There was a great deal he didn't understand. Who was Zero? What was the Nonary game? Why had this, he been chosen to make them... Why had he chosen to make them part of it? Was he a criminal who took delight in playing with his victims? Or did he have some other purpose? And why had Junpei been chosen as part of this insane game? Why had any of them been chosen? But one question was foremost in his mind. Akane. They hadn't seen each other since elementary school. Why had she appeared now? Coincidence? No, that seemed impossible. There had to be a reason. I didn't know what it might be, but there had to be a reason. Very well. The lion's voice seemed oddly loud in the silence. Standing around here won't do us any good. Best we get moving, don't you think? Get moving? Are you planning to open the numbered doors? But, hey, wait! Don't tell me you're actually going to do what this, this zero says! No, no, that's not what I mean. The lion shook his head, mildly annoyed. I'm saying, let's find another way. After all, we haven't really examined this place yet. Wh what That's not good. Their separate investigations finished. All nine people returned to where they'd left one another. The result of all their work was... nothing. They were completely sealed in. Their hard work had not gone completely to waste, however. They had learned a number of things as they scoured the parts of the ship they could reach. It seemed that they were confined to decks A through C. C deck was far down as they could be able to go, however. The reason being... The D deck was completely submerged. Strangely, however, the water had risen no higher than D-Deck. The flow seems to have stopped somehow, as evidenced by the surface of the water of D-Deck, which was smooth as glass. So Zero must somehow be manipulating how much water he's letting in to make it so that it lasts nine hours. The prince knelt down and gently drew his hand across it. Perhaps the Zero fellow has used some sort of remote control to seal a watertight door lower down. He said our time limit was nine hours. In other words, this water won't rise for nine hours. Then you're saying we won't sink till then? Well, oh, that might be a little too optimistic. 
No point to wishful thinking. I think we are already sunk, and he's just gonna let more water in until to the point where we don't have air anymore. That's my theory. How are you today? Enjoying this game thus far? Well, oh, so far I've had an hour and 20 minutes of the game. Yes, I'm enjoying it uh, so far though. I, I like the mystery so far. Uh, the characters seem like they could be pretty interesting. Uh, I, I'm gonna work really hard to give them all unique voices whenever possible, and I look forward to that challenge. Um, I do look for uh, feedback from folks though. I'm The way I have the screens positioned, like I can change the screens whenever I want. Boom, boom. Let me know which one you guys prefer for these sections where it's text heavy on the bottom screen for me and it just a blank picture on the top screen. I'm thinking of keeping the top screen the main screen because that's when the characters show up and they talk, They're, that accentuates them. But if folks want it the other way around, let me know. There are three metal doors on C deck. A single door stood off to the side with two more on the wall facing the central staircase. Ever watch anyone else play these types of games before? Well, I I mean, 999, I, I think there's a lot of people who do stream this occasionally. I know Elegy of Games is eventually going to get to it, and he's my favorite streamer of all time. I think uh, You Pick Games did it. Um, but yeah, I think there are some people who are getting to this game eventually. Uh, I, I, I'm just glad I'm getting into it before them. <laughs> that way I can watch them play it. Single door stood up two more on the wall facing the central staircase. None of them had numbers or verification devices. They were, however, locked like the other doors. No matter how much they pushed and shoved, the doors refused to move. Mountain and Lion threw themselves against them a few times with no avail. The door in the back had a keyhole. Just above it was a strange mark in the shape of a circular surrounding a dot. Circle surrounding a dot. There were two other doors on C-Deck as well, but it was clear they were elevators. Each had a button next to them with an upside-down triangle. They tried pushing the button. No response. Apparently there was no power running onto the elevators. To the left of the elevator doors was a card reader. I wonder if that would activate the power. The card reader also had a strange mark on it. It looked like a lowercase h with a dash looking through the stem. Huh, I'm gonna try and write down that symbol. Wow, I actually drew that symbol pretty well. Holy shit! What is wrong with my handwriting today? It's good! Looks like a lowercase h, yeah, yeah. Junpei stared at it for a while. This is the symbol of Saturn. Oh, Saturn, huh? I better write that down. I will not remember that. It's an astrology symbol. Then the mark on the other door. I think that was the sun symbol. All right, let's write that down as well. They had seen the same symbol on A-deck. Symbols on A-deck. There was a door on either side of the stairs. Uh, the one that on the left had a keyhole with a similar symbol engraved in it. I bet that's the moon? No, that's Earth. That's an Earth. This is an Earth symbol. The horizontal lines that symbolize the equator and the vertical ones represent the prime meridian. Junpei looked up at the ceiling. There was a great circle cut in it. Perhaps for a skylight or a glass dome, it had been filled with a gargantuan metal plate. The metal looked very solid. It also looks sort of like the air symbol. Yeah, anything short of an explosive charge was likely, unlikely to damage it. There were several windows along both sides of the ship. Or at least there had been. They too were covered with metal plates. Very Danganronpa! In other words... We're trapped. All the exits go nowhere! Jinpei was not happy. The girl with pink hair spoke up. Well, I'm sure they go somewhere. We just can't open them. And the mountain spoke. You don't know that. For all we know, they just open into walls or take us in circles. The prince did not agree. No, I'm sure they go somewhere. Otherwise, what point would there to be? And we can open them. Well, two of them at least. You mean the numbered doors? All eyes turned to the doors with numbers on them. The atmosphere in the room grew tense. Hey, wait a minute. I think I said earlier, but I don't think we should do that. The dancer moved in front of the doors as if to block them. We'd have to be crazy to open these doors. If we do that, we're doing exactly what Zero wants us to do. Suddenly, everyone began to smoke at once. I agree. I don't. That's a terrible idea. We should keep going. We should stay here. We don't have any other way to open any of these doors. We should just wait. Someone's bound to come find us. We don't have time for that. 
In eight and a half hours, this ship is going to sink. The clamor of voices made it to next to impossible to determine who was saying what. The arguments grew more and more intense until people were shouting and screaming at one another. Junpei had remained silent, but at last he could take no more. Hey! Shut up! They fell silent and all eyes turned to Junpei. He felt each stare burning into him, but he refused to flinch. Before we try and decide where we're going to go, there's something else we ought to do. What's that? We need to exchange information. We don't know anything about each other. I want to know who you guys are. Who you are, why you're, where you came from, why you ended up here. Don't tell me you aren't curious, too. They were silent. Some of them looked the other way, or bit their lip, or crossed their arms and stared at the ceiling. But one of them spoke up. It was Akane. I agree. I think Jumpy is right. Jumpy? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about him. I just call him Jumpy. His name's Junpei. She pointed towards Junpei. We're childhood friends. We went to the same elementary school. Wait, stop! Don't tell us stuff we didn't ask you about. Zero's probably watching us right now. What are you gonna do if he's listening in? Dude! Junpei was abducted from his house? Chances are Zero knows everything he needs to know. Would that be bad? Hell yeah, it would. We don't know much that bastard knows about us. Maybe he just picked a bunch of random people to kidnap. If that is the case, then it'd be dangerous for us to let him know too much. If Zero knows where we are, you could go after our families. Maybe tell us the Adam to get us to do stuff, you know? But we still need to know what our names are. It's gonna be hard to talk to each other if we don't know to have names. Alright. Why don't we have code names? To him, apparently, it seems an obvious solution. Code names? Yeah, we'll let you pick something. Like, I'll be seven. Seven? Why are you seven? Oh, we're just gonna call each other after our numbers. Well, I'm gonna write down what I know about each person. Like, Mountain. At least they're, the names Jumbe give them are descriptive, right? Mountain is seven. The mountain stuck out his left arm. Because this bracelet number says seven. Oh, I get it. Yeah, that's a good idea. He smirked. All right, I'm gonna be Santa. What? Damn it, pencil! Come back here! My, my pencil dropped. Silver, I'm not calling you Santa. That's dumb. Although, uh, isn't Santa in another language a number? Any of you chumps know Japanese? No. Well, seven, Nissan, means three. So it'll be Santa. You know, like Santa Claus. It's, don't you think? Alright, son. Santa. Four, three. Okay, I guess if he wants to be Santa Claus, he can be Santa Claus. And your bracelet number. Yeah, it's got a three on it. Good job, Grandpa. Just like Mountain had done, Silver thrust out his left hand. Sure enough, the face of the bracelet read three. Very well then. I'll go next, shall I? My bracelet number is one. Alright, so Lion is one. Given that, I think Ace seems appropriate. Alright, we'll call you Ace. I'll be Lotus then. Alright, Lotus Denser. Lotus Eight. I'll be Lotus then. As I'm sure you all know, it has eight petals. Which means, of course, that my bracelet number is... Eight. I would appreciate it if you would call me Snake. I'm not giving you Snake's voice. Prince is Snake. Two? Why is Snake associated with two? My bracelet number is two. Since Ace has chosen cards, then I choose dice. Snake eyes, clearly. Which is particularly relevant, given that I am blind. Blind? Really? He kept his eyes closed during their entire ordeal, which has suggested something strange, but to hear it said so casually, it was something of a surprise. Everyone seemed a little nervous at the prince's proclamation, but no one seemed to know how to react to it. There was one person, however, who did not seem to be surprised in the least. A girl with pink hair. I want to be Clover. Alright. Pink is Clover. Which probably makes you a four? You know, like a four-leaf Clover. Good luck, right? Alright. 
bore. Looking almost bored, she held out her left hand. The face of the bracelet showed the number four. He'd come around to Junpei. He held out his bracelet. Alright, my number's five. My codename's gonna be... Why well, have one? It's not like there's any point to it now. The dancer cut him off mid-sentence. I mean, we all know your name already. You're Junpei. No, oh. They all nodded. Akane stepped forward nervously. Then you should all call me by my name too. This, I mean, it doesn't seem... That doesn't seem fair to Jumpy. You're thinking, you're thinking it's not cool to hide your name after you told us his. Akane fidgeted awkwardly. Junpei decided to, he had to do something. What's your bracelet number? It's six. Alright, so Akane is six. She hesitated for a moment and held out her left hand. As she'd claimed the bracelet face was showed six, Junpei looked at it for a moment and thought. Alright then, why don't we call you June? I'm gonna call her June, huh? June. Yeah, you know, it's the sixth month of the year. So you're June. Jumpy. Akane had, had, had needed her hands and looked up at Junpei uncertain. He smiled back at her reassuringly. Are you good with that? She thought about it for a few more minutes, then just came to the decision and gave Junpei a small nod. The names decided, Junpei ran over them as quickly in his head. Um, we're missing someone. Who's the dude with the bird's nest in his head? Nine. One was Ace. Two was Snake. Three was Santa. Four was Clover. Five was Junpei's number. Akane was six. And Junpei given codename of June. 7 was 7, and 8 was Lotus. That meant the 8 of them, including Junpei, had revealed their bracelet numbers. There was still one person left. He was the man with glasses and hair like a bird's nest. He hadn't said anything since they met in the stairs, and he didn't look like the sort of person who was inclined to conversation. His skin was pale, his breathing was heavy, and he was soaked with nervous sweat. His behavior seemed very suspicious, or perhaps simply emotionally unstable. It was difficult to tell. Whatever the case, it seemed clear that he had only fingertips worth of grip on his sanity. The girl with pink hair Clover walked up to him slowly. She put her hands on her hips and eyed him suspiciously. What number are you? He didn't answer. His bloodshot eyes twitched from person to person his breath came in hot pants. Hey, I'm talking to you! The man licked his dry lips with a shaking tongue and spoke with a voice like old paper. Isn't it obvious? Nine people here. And you know who numbers one through eight are? I'm the only one left. So you're nine? Y yeah. He extended a trembling arm. Alright, bird's nest is nine. Good to confirm it. He extended his trembling arm. The bracelet didn't seem to say nine. Whoever looked at him contemptuously. What's your code name? C -c 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 code name? What do you want us to call you? We all made up names, you should too. Uh, I don't need one. Why not? Because I'm not going to stay here with you. He took a shuddering breath and exhaled. Clover looked at him with something very like disgust. You've got some sort of plan? I do. Yeah? What's that? Y you sure you won't want to know? Yeah? Alright, let me show you. I'm going to do this! Ah! And by the time we realized what he was doing, it was too late to stop him. The man's body moved like a snake's. In the blink of an eye, he had slid around behind her and wrapped his arms around her waist. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? Silver, Santa, slept forward toward Clover and the ninth man. He was halfway there when... Stay back! Suddenly, the man's ho hand dove into his pocket. He came back out with a knife. A pocket knife. He held it to Clover's pale, quivering neck. If you get any closer, I'll c cut her open! Santa skidded to a halt. He snarled at the scrawny man with a knife and gritted his teeth. Yes, that's right. The man's smile was neither friendly nor reassuring. Sweat poured down his neck, soaking the color of his shirt. Clover, are you alright? The prince, Snake's voice, sounded oddly concerned. Y yeah I'm fine. Her voice shook, making her words even less convincing. What the hell are you trying to do? Yeah, this guy's a bit of a creeper. 
I don't like him. I, I told you! This is my plan! What are you gonna do to her, you sick son of a bitch? Don't worry. I'm not gonna do anything to her. If she just does what I tell her to, I'll let her go. He started to move backwards, slowly keeping his grip on Clover. What's your plan here, Nine? Are you thinking you're cons you can somehow get Zero to let us out if you threaten to kill her and ruin his plan of whatever it is, torture he's supposed to put us through? I'm pretty sure if you want to kill her, he'll just let you. Keeping their distance, Junpei and the others followed. Eventually, the man reached the wall. He gave a start as his back touched it, then glanced around quickly and spoke. V -v -v Verify. Uh -huh. The left. Look to your left. Do you see the device on the wall? Place your hand on the scanner panel, the round part. No, you idiot. We're supposed to be looking for digital roots, not for just straight up- Oh, if he's at door four, he's fine. Because nine plus, uh... 9 plus 4 is 13, and 13 turns into 4 as a digital root. However, they did specifically say that we need 3 to 4 to 5 people in each room. So, your plan doesn't really work if there's just a two of you. Uh, I gotta follow. Uh, Siri that has. Siri that has? That's what it looked like. Um, weird. Hold on, give me a sec. I'm gonna move that notification, because... That is in the worst possible place for me to be able to read it. Put it over there. All right. Well, thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. Place your head. Place your head in the scanner panel. The round part. And what if I don't? The man's nostrils flared, and he looked like he was about to choke. Uh, are you an idiot? What do you think? I could slit your throat right now. I'll kill you if I have to. All I need is your bracelet. How does he know this much? I mean, I made the uh, the guess in my head, I didn't say it aloud, that that's what these are for. But he's making a lot of assumptions that he's absolutely right. Or, he knows something. Sir Matt, ah, hello. Uh, everything was screwed up on my notification. Thank you for the follow, I appreciate it. Just do it! To do it now! He pressed the knife against Clover's neck hard. Slowly, she stretched out her left hand toward the device. Her back was to it. She was able to. F she had to feel around for a moment before she found the circular panel. It was cold. Oh, like made a cold electronic noise, and on the display above her hand, an asterisk appeared. So that was how it worked. Junpei thought to himself, by placing one's palm on the ninth, uh, on what ninth man had called the scanner panel, the user's bracelet number would be entered in the device. Well, actually, he muff. <laughs> Thank you for maintaining the blind playthrough, Sir Matt. <laughs> Should your total numbers on your numbered bracelets and find uh, what the digital root of that number is equal to the number of that on the door, the door will open. Junpei shifted his eyes to the door itself. Nobody's at five. The number on it was five. You need one more person. Ninth man seemed to know a little more about the device operation than he should. Meta Knight Kirby, hello! You guys are just in time for drama! After the ni after all nine people have gotten together, the ninth man, who refuses to name himself, has uh, decided to ki uh, to kidnap, well, sort of, to threaten the fourth uh, number four of our group to try and get inside one of the doors. How do you know exactly what to do? Good, good. You're done. Next. Okay, so he does need more people. He knows exactly what he's doing. His bloodshot eyes crept from person to person until finally. Uh, I think I just gave the rundown, actually. <laughs> Side effects of playing this game. Compulsively calculate digital root of every number you see. I'm getting that impression. Okay. So, 4 plus 9 is 13, digital root of that is 4, so he needs number 1. He's gonna grab Ace. Lion is not gonna let you play nice. <laughs> they stopped on the Lion. Ace. You, right? You're the one with the number 1 bracelet, right? Yes, I am. So? Then you're next. Just verify your number, like little brat did. Okay, hold on. Let's assume the three of them go into that door. Because he did say, Zero said, everybody who scans has to enter the door and contribute. So, one, 
four, and nine are taken. That leaves two, three, five, six, seven, eight. If you add those together, that's 10, 16, 23, 31. That would equal four. So if those three go in, the rest of us can go in the last door. But didn't he say something about three to five? So that doesn't work, does it? Because we need, that's six more people. Hmm, I wonder. Just verify your number like this old brat did. What are you doing? To do it! I know, Sir Matt. I, I like... I like waiting. I like looking, thinking it through myself and coming up with my own conclusions before the story uh, progresses. One of the things I love to do on my channel is speculate. I like to speculate on blind games and uh, wonder about things that are happening. D don't you care what happens to her? Uh, okay, just calm down. Ace held up his hands, palms out. The ninth man jerked his chin toward the device. Slowly, cautiously, and Ace moved towards the device. After what seemed like an agonizing eternity, he reached it. N no, verify! Ace nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. The device beeped again, and second asterisk appeared. Now the device had Clover and Ace's numbers. Four and one. Four plus one equals five. The same as the number written on the door. But it wouldn't open just yet. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. Alright, so if you have 1, 4, and 9, that equals your 14 to equal 15. To get the next number, to get yourself to a 5 digital root, you still need to get two more people at least. You could do it with three more people though, but then, yeah, that's way too many. Hmm. I wonder what he's planning. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. The door needed at least one more person. Who would that be? G -g -g get back! His voice shook, but the knife he held on the clover's throat made his words a uh, command. Ace took two, and three steps back. The use of moving the door in what seems to be an attorney happens too often in narration for me to take seriously. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. That's sort of a bit of a trope. No, further. More than that, go all the way to the back. Slowly Ace did what he was told. The ninth man's lips curled into a cruel, twisted smile. That was when Jupe understood his plan. Clover's four and Ace's one added to the ninth man nine. Four plus one nine equals fourteen. One plus four equals five. In other words... <laughs> Thank god, you are also cooperative, and I can get out of this nightmare! He pressed his own hand against the scanner panel. The third asterisk appeared on screen. He dropped his hand to the lever on the side of the device and pulled. The door opened with a heavy metallic groan. He let go of Clover. Wait! Junpei leapt towards the ninth man, but he wasn't fast enough. The man shoved Clover, ah, and hopped through the door. I I okay, have a good one, guys. I'm going off ahead now. Well then, goodbye. He raised his hand and waved a twisted smirk on his face, and he was gone. The door ground shut with a dull cling of metal on metal. He's already broken a rule. I don't like where this is going. C clover Are you alright? Snake ran to Clover's side as he lay on the floor. Yeah, I'm fine. She climbed unsteadily to her feet and once there leaned heavily on Snake's shoulder for support. Junpei ran to the door. The others followed him. Several pairs of hands grabbed hold of the handles and pulled. They grunted and strained, but... Shit! It won't budge! That was when Lotus, the dancer, spoke. Her voice was quiet. Do you hear something? Like what? Like some sort of... beeping. Junpei pressed his ear against the cold metal of the door. Don't put your face near that door! I think I know what's happening! The others did the same. Get the fuck away from that door! You're right. I can hear it too. What is it? 
Then they heard something else. It was the ninth man. Shit! Why isn't it stopping? God damn it! You lied! Lied? This wasn't supposed to happen! This is wrong! This is wrong! His voice shook with fear. Safe on the outside, they stepped back from the door and looked at one another. What is happening in there? He's gonna blow the fuck up! Open the door! Please! I'm begging you! Help me! Please get me out of here! Get me out of here! Please! Look, someone get 8, 5, and 1 down there. I mean, come on. We, we shouldn't just leave him there to explode. Of course, if he explodes out here, we're in trouble. But maybe if we bring him back, he won't be breaking the rules anymore? Shupei grabbed hold of the device. He slammed his head on the scanner panel. Nothing happened. Well, I'm glad Junpei had the same reaction I did. I can appreciate that kind of, uh, that kind of compassion. I can't tie its story on the punishment system. <laughs> Why didn't it register him? He looked at the display where the asterisk showed up. It said engaged. Well, I'm glad that panel found love. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god, there's no time left. Listen. I was lied to! He lied to me! He put me in here! It was him! He killed me! It was him! Ah. Well! They have explosives in them. Yay! The explosion rocked the room. Instinctively, they ducked and stood up slowly when they realized there was no danger. No one spoke. Silence filled the room. In that silence, the electronic tone that echoed throughout the room sounded as loud as a gunshot. All eyes turned toward it. Vacant! Hey! I don't want to be the one that goes through door 5. I don't want to see what's on the other side. Can I go to door 4? It had come from the device mounted next to the door. The display changed from engaged to vacant. Oh, I'm sorry your engagement didn't work out. Let's see if we can open it. Seven, the mountain swallowed hard. Junpei nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. No, that means you have to go in. Said more like a gunshot and an explosion, but whatever. Keep in mind, it was behind, like, a big metal door. Narration in this game is purple and prosy. <laughs> the game is faster than me. The device had registered Junpei's bracelet number, 5. He was not enough, however. At least two more people were needed. Junpei asked, Which pair? Oh, shit. I have to make the choice. Well, the last thing I want is for June to be stuck with other people, and I have questions for her. Santa doesn't seem very good as far as, you know, uh, decision maker. Ace and Lotus would honestly probably be a good team just because i think ace is really good and he won't be distracted by lotus whereas i think other characters might snake and seven mm. i think snake really needs to be paired up with clover so i guess santa and june will have to do santa and uh june think you can give me a hand here the pun was a little too on the nose but the mood was still grim both santa and june lifted their hands silently He verified, and she followed suit. 5, 3, 6 equals 14. 1 plus 4 equals 5. They'd fulfilled their conditions. If they were to pull the lever on the side... Are you guys ready? I'm gonna open it. Junpei grabbed the lever and looked back over his shoulder. They stiffened and nodded. Junpei nodded back and set his mouth to a grim line. And he slowly lowered the lever. I am not looking forward to what's on the other side of this door. <laughs> Sir Matt, that's fair? Wait, she didn't look old to me. No. One. Two. I think Ace can keep it in his pants long enough to get shit done. Three. I don't know if any of these people are single. They could all be married to each other for all I know. From town girl and the door slow open, a breath of air drifted out of it, carrying a stench that nearly made them gag. 
Junpei grimaced and put a hand over his mouth. Oh my god. Good god. Lotus and Ace shuddered. Seven grunted. Whoa, that's... pretty bad. Even Santa's voice shook. He... he blew up. It appeared Santa was right. The hallway on the other side of the door was splattered with chunks of torn flesh and dark red blood. Oh! Yikes! Ah! A shriek uh, echoed across the room. I'm not going to do a shriek, by the way. Yeah, that, that's, that's the best girl scream you're going to get out of me. It had come from June. Then her strength left her and she dropped. The Junpei turned to catch her. The door groaned shut. Wait, what? No, we're right... Uh... Did we goof? Your other points stand. <laughs> she crumpled to the floor. June, you okay? Junpei dropped to his knees and put his arm around her shoulders. That was when he noticed. Her whole body was feverish. She was radiating intense heat. What the hell? Where'd this fever come from? June didn't answer. Her face looked like wax, and her whole body began to shake. Alright, let's just rest for a minute, okay? You think you can walk? She nodded weakly. Junpei lifted June to her feet and guided her to a nearby chair. Here we go. As gently he could, he set her down in it. How are you feeling? Are you alright? <laughs> that looks really awful. Yeah, the blood! The blood was a little... Yeah. That room is been painted. With people. She nodded, and as she did, a single huge tear rolled down the side of her face. She got Ghibli tears going on. Why? Why did this happen? Dear Ninth Man, your face is split. Actually, it was more of his wrist, but then everything else also. Her voice cracked, broken by misery and grief, and choked by sobs. Why did this happen? Junpei spun around. Do any of you know what the fuck is going on here? Who's Zero? What's this nonary game? He did specifically mention other people know what the nonary game is. Nine was probably one of them, but I bet other people do too. And I suspect Ace. Come on! Anybody! Anything! What the hell is going on? What are we doing here? No one spoke. Ace, Snake, Santa, Clover, Seven, and Lotus. They simply stood there. Seven pairs of downcast eyes and seven grim lines for mouths. June's body shook with silent sobs. They lo slowed as the minutes ticked by and eventually they stopped. God damn single sexy tear. She's got Polyphemus. Maybe we can still do this. <laughs> it is. Polyphemus is one of my favorite items, that's for sure. Then suddenly, in the cold, heavy silence that had enveloped them like a thick fog, a bell began to ring. Don't tell me it's already eight. Or, I'm sorry, ten. Eight hours left is what I meant to say. The clock in the central hall. Seven, eight, nine, ten times. Shit. They've used up an entire hour and they haven't even gone through a door yet. And then on the tenth ring it stopped. The sound of the bell faded away into silence. It's ten o'clock then. He said what each of them had been thinking. That means it's been an hour since Zero's little announcement. Seven's deep voice echoed across the room. Fuck! Had enough of this crap! Santa leapt to his feet, his fists clenched. How long are we gonna pussyfoot around like this? We've only got eight hours until time limit Zero was going on and about is up. Let's get going already! Let's go, go! Santa's outburst fell on deaf ears. No one seemed to agree with him. They stared back at him, their eyes blank and their faces tired. Finally, Lotus spoke. No, I refuse. I'm not going to end up like him. Him? You mean the ninth man? Of course. Who else? In his mind's eye, Junpei saw the corpse again. Nine wasted hours, nine person side doors. <laughs> the dark reddish black pool of blood. The scattered pieces of flesh. Organs strewn about the floor like a blossoming of a grotesque flower. The explosion that had torn through his body had been powerful. The ninth man's neck had been twisted at an angle. Shinpei suspected the detonation had thrown him against the wall. Half of his face was crushed, and the other half was covered in blood. Most of his abdomen had been emptied. Thanks for this absolutely graphic description of person being blown up, game. This is exactly what I needed. Yeesh. Either by the explosion, or by gravity. 
He had landed on his back, and stark white ribs jutted out of his chest like the legs of some macabre crab. Junpei felt something flip in his stomach. I think he just... screwed up! Eyebrows went up, and Santa continued. Wait, nobody else made this connection? Seriously? Probably set off some sort of trap, and that killed him. I'm not gonna screw up like that. I'm getting out of here alive. Oh, you think it was a trap in there, not that he intentionally broke the rules. Got it. <laughs> Whatever Snake was laughing at, Santa did not find particularly humorous. What's so goddamn funny? Oh, my apologies. You were just so very confident. I couldn't help myself. What the fuck? I think you've mistaken the situation. Huh? The Knights Van Death had nothing to do with the trap. At least not the sort of trap you imagine it did. Thank you, somebody who figured it out. Then, he broke one of Zero's rules. That was why he died. It's simple if you think about it. You still don't. Alright, how about you take a moment and think back to what Zero said. Specifically, what did he say about the number of people? He said only three to five people can pass through the number door, right? And after that, you've forgotten the relevant part. What did Zero say? Santa furrowed his brow and thought. Junpei thought back. Zero said, Everyone who verified has to go. All those who enter must leave, and all who enter must contribute, right? I think it was something like that. Whatever it was, it means the group of less than three, or more than five, can't go through. That is correct. A gold star for you, Junpei. Snake inclined his head towards Junpei. The ninth man, however, broke that rule. He tried to pass through another door by himself. That was why he was executed. Then, Zero's watching us from somewhere, making sure we don't break any rules. Oh, I'm not so sure of that. Why not? Because this execution system is entirely automatic. Didn't notice? There's no need for him to monitor us. What do you mean? Snake looked at Seven with what could only be described as pity, and sighed. Very well. I see I must be the one who tells you. I've waited long enough, I suppose. I'd hoped Zero might spare me some trouble, but that seems increasingly unlikely. I was grateful didn't actually show the gory details. That's fair. Yeah. He couldn't see them, of course, but perhaps Snake sensed the confused eyes upon him. When he spoke, he gave words to everyone else's thoughts. Do you know something? Well, I know a great deal many things, but yes. What is it you know? Yeah. Stink removed a card from his pocket of his jacket. With a flourish, he presented it to Ace, took a close look at it, and spoke. Come on now. What's the point of giving me this? Give me that. Snake's, the sna Santa snatched the card from Ace, but his expression of disgust quickly turned one to confusion. Huh? The hell is this? Seven tugged it out of Santa's hands. Eh, I see. The card went from Seven to Lotus, from Lotus to June, and finally to Junpei. He looked at it and understood. This is Braille. Braille, the written language of the blind. The card was covered in small embossed pumps. Junpei could recognize it, but he certainly couldn't read it. Sorry guys, I can't read this. Junpei handed the card back to Snake, who nodded at him with a small smirk. Okay, that was fun, but what's so important about that card? I found it in my pocket. I can only assume it is a message from Zero. F from Zero? A message? What does it say? Suddenly everyone was crowding around J Snake, desperate to hear what the message said. Santa especially looked as if he was about to grab hold of Snake and shake the answers from him. Snake raised his hand. Calm down now. No need to panic. You don't need to force me, I'll read it. Junpei swallowed hard and waited for him to start. He was not the only one. Presently Snake began to read, his voice calm. His fingers glided over the tiny bumps as he spoke. Bracelet number two. Since you are not blessed with sight, I shall bless you, and only you, with information. I shall tell you of the function of red, of the dead, and of the bracelet. The red is the recognition device. It will verify your number. Beside every number door, you will find a red. The dead is the deactivation device. It does exactly what it says. Once you have passed through the number door, you must use the dead to stop the detonator on your bracelet. Perhaps you are wondering, what does this detonator detonate? I'm afraid that may be something of a surprise. 
and I placed a small bomb inside of you, and the people you are about to meet. Oh, it's not in the bracelet, it's in our stomachs. You see, it, when they were discussing the details of how the other guy's gore happened, I didn't. it didn't occur to me that the explosion came from inside his stomach, even though that obviously the exposed ribs and organs and stuff. I thought he simply held the uh, bracelet close to his body for some reason. Or it was like near his chest or stomach, and that caused the uh, the explosion. I did take note of how the explosion happened, but I didn't come to the conclusion that they were uh, that uh, that this was the case. Swallowed it while you were unconscious. I have no doubt. By the time you read this note, the bomb will have passed your stomach and found its way into your small intestine. In other words, you will be unable to regurgitate it. I suggest you do not try. Hmm. How long does it take to pass something like that? As mentioned before, the bracelet in the left hand contains a detonator. Think of it as a remote fuse, or timer, of the bomb in your body. This is only one condition which will cause it to detonate. The con that condition is that you enter a number door. Once you have done so, the timer will activate, no matter who you may be. You will have, of eight, eight, you will have 81 seconds. Cute! Digital root of nine. If after that time the detonator has not been activated, it will send a signal to the bomb in your body, instructing it to explode. In order to deactivate the detonator, every person who verified the number at the red must also verify the numbers at the dead. Once all numbers have been verified by the dead, you need only pull the lever at the side, and the countdown will cease. Anyone who does not verify the number at the red will find themselves unable to verify the number at the dead. That is to say. If you pass through the number door without first verifying your number at the red, in 81 seconds, you will be dead. You must also keep in mind that the number doors will close automatically after 9 seconds has passed. <laughs> 81 is also 9 squared. Well, yeah, but I'm sure digital root is more important. Uh, and dude, this guy is so obsessed with that number. So long as the door is open, the dead will not function. You should do well to remember this. So it makes 90 seconds total. Which is 9 times 10, obviously. Cute! This guy has some fucked up uh, number obsessions, doesn't he? Lastly, let's discuss how to remove the bracelets. There are only two ways to do so. One, you escape from the ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. That's an interesting way to put it. In say, if you're dead, you can remove the bracelets. He said if your heart rate reaches zero. Huh. In other words, once the bracelet is taken outside the confines of the ship, or detects that the wearer's heartbeat has fallen to zero, it will shut down automatically. There is no other way to remove your bracelet. If you attempt to force it off, or disable the detonator, <laughs> I used to... I used the face and... Hold on, I want to see this. It totally did! <laughs> That's so cool! Hold on, uh, it, it might auto-purge links, so I'm gonna copy that so other people can see it. Because that's hilarious. If you attempt to force it off or disable it, near the bomb uh, within you will immediately explode. This is all the information which I can impart to you. How you choose to use it is for you to decide. If used wisely, you can eliminate those who might be in danger for you, to you. For the time being, you might be able to control your fate. I wish you the best of luck. Snake finished reading and carefully returned the card to his pocket. The message had been lengthy, but its meaning was clear. Only those with verified numbers at the red can pass through numbered doors. Teams could not increase or decrease their uh, numbers. The reds, deads, and bracelets enforced the rules. They were judge, jury, and executioner. In defiance of zero suggestions, both Santa and Seven put fingers down the throats and began to gag. The rest stiffened. Some touched their stomachs. Some simply stared at the bracelets. Junpei gingerly touched his stomach. There was a bomb inside his body. The thought of it made him queasy. His stomach felt oddly hollow, and his legs were weak. Why had Zero designed such a ludicrous game? Junpei looked over at the others. I forgot that I actually need to take my first break. <laughs> Whoopsie. Things were getting very dramatic, and I wanted to read all that first. But get up, stretch, what we need to do, be able to keep watching comfortably. And I will be right back. <laughs> 